I, I think we, you will soon find we've got some of the finest minds in the Republican conference at the table already. You, many of these folks know that I have never been bashful about acknowledging my heroes. I think this is a nation that should cherish heroes and I think we as a, as a culture should teach our children to have and to cherish their heroes. And uh, as, as most of these folks know, Milton Friedman is a hero of mine, having made a, I believe, a disciplined decision to become a professional economist for a lifetime. Obviously, it was for me a great inspiration to have the works of Professor Friedman. You know him as a Nobel laureate and an advisor to presidents, as a writer of an incredibly good books, a producer of one of the most learned uh, uh, shows on public TV, uh, free to choose, and a person who always can speak sense on the subject of economics in a language we can all understand. I have defined economics to my students over the years as the uh, discipline that tells you things you've known all your life in a language you can't understand. <laughs> Dr. Friedman tells us things that are ordinarily too complex for us to comprehend in a language we can understand. So, <laughs> Professor Friedman, it is for me an extraordinary pleasure to welcome you here among the Republican Conference. The, the, uh, uh, Professor Friedman has agreed that he will speak briefly and then open it up for a dialogue of questions and responses. Thank you, Congressman Army. I may tell you that my first contact with Congressman Army was when he was not a congressman but a professor at Texas A&M and I was at that time writing Newsweek columns and I wrote a Newsweek column uh, di uh, directed to the topic of the fact that most well intentioned, almost essentially every well-intentioned law always produce, produces results which are the opposite of those that were intended, the unintended consequences of these laws. And I said, why isn't there a good name for this, like Murphy's Law or something like that, that would keep it in the public attention? And I asked readers to send in suggestions. And I got a whole bunch of suggestions, and the suggestion that I liked best and put was at the top of the list was from <laughs> your colleague. And he said, why don't we call it the invisible foot of government? <laughs> And I, I have been using that ever since. I give credit to Dick Army when I do, but I think that was a marvelous way of putting it. Your mention of the PBS station is a thing uh, is important from a different point of view. PBS is consistently hostile to programs that have a free market, private enterprise perspective. And the only reason why Free to Choose was ever got on public television was because a year before they had run John Kenneth Scalbrace's series on uh, uh, Age of Uncertainty. And the contrast was so sharp that they were shamed into letting this on. But in 19, a few years ago, three or four years ago, we did a kind of a little update of Free to Choose in which we had five programs instead of ten, had new discussions and included one new program dealing with Eastern Europe. And PBS, we could not get PBS to carry it. So I think one of the, it, it's a nice illustration of how uh, governmental agencies, which PBS really is, get turned into a, a propaganda agencies, not necessarily by those people who are supposed to run them, but by the simple bureaucracy. Because the board that's supposed, the PBS board that's supposed to run it, is typically cons has uh, open-minded, public-spirited individuals on it who would be much more uh, tolerant of a variety of views. But the final decisions are made by the bureaucracy. That's the same thing you've experienced in the Endowment for the Humanities, Endowment for the Arts, the same thing everywhere. Uh, I, I'm going to, mostly I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have. I might say in opening simply that uh, I regard the economic problems we're facing as, of relatively, uh, as significant but not of great importance because what's destroying this country at the moment are not the economic problems. We're fundamentally economically a very strong country and in uh, Adam's, the words I always cite from Adam Smith when a young man uh, uh, said that the defeat of 
Cornwallis at Yorktown was going to be the ruination of Britain, Adam Smith said, young man, there's a deal of ruin in a nation. And there's a deal of ruin in a nation. But the major problems we face are, in my opinion, the social non-economic problems of deteriorating education, collapsing families, uh, increasing crime and lawlessness. Uh, you can name them. You know the litany of them. Almost all of which have been produced by and are attributable to government actions. And that's the real... Uh, government has done a lot of bad things in the economic area. Don't misunderstand me. We all have a long litany of them. <coughs> and those are capable of doing a great deal of harm over a longer period. But the more immediate present danger, in my opinion, is the harm that is being done to the basic character of our society by these non-economic social problems, which government is at the source of almost invariably. Yes. Thank well, you. let's go ahead. I'm sorry. I, uh, I understand what you're saying, but uh, doesn't the uh, economy and the well-being of, uh, of this country have something to do with part of that? When you have a flourishing economy and you have a low uh, unemployment rate and you have families that are not uh, going through the trauma that they are going through now with either unemployment or the threat of unemployment. Uh, don't you feel that that adds to the, the, the dilemma? Uh, very, to a very minor extent, but suppose you look at these problems and ask whether that's the source of them. The declining, deteriorating education has nothing to do with that. The deterior you have deteriorating education because you have a government monopoly, you have a socialized educational industry, which is performing like all socialized industries. It's producing a bad product at high cost with a, a small special groups getting great benefits and the large unwashed masses paying the cost. And that has almost nothing to do with the problems of unemployment or of economic conditions. Lawlessness, crime and uh, 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 the growth of crime and the uh, unlivability of the inner cities has far more to do with a futile attempt to prohibit drugs than it has to do with unemployment or current economic matters. Uh, so I agree with you that what you're describing are contributing factors, and I would agree also that our present economic policies are bad. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not coming out in favor of those economic policies. I, like to ask I think a government is too big and ought to be cut down to size. I think taxes are too high and ought to be reduced. I think government is largely responsible, is in considerable part responsible to the high level of unemployment. Let me cite you one figure that I came across recently that really I think will shock you. As we all know, in 1946, the government passed a Full Employment Act, which involved government taking responsibility for achieving full employment. The average level of unemployment from that day to this has been 5.7%. What do you suppose the average rate of unemployment was between 1900 and 1929 when federal government spending was 3% of the national income? 4.6%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a fundamental difference there. In that period, you still had tremendous American growth based on a rising demand from an increasingly prosperous middle class in the cities. You and and um, what you had in the Second World War was where you had the lowest employment of the century. Why? Because everybody was fully employed. And uh, that's far different than what you've run into in a more static economy with less economic growth in the last 40 years. First of all, let's get the facts straight. In the early years of the 20th century saw an enormous inflow of immigrants from abroad. Right. The largest number, of, the largest flow of immigrants percentage-wise, all, almost all of whom were unskilled, had no capital, that surely raised problems comparable to those we have now. Second place, the period, the 25 years after World War II, saw the most rapid rate of economic growth of almost any 25-year period you can go back. The economic growth has been slower and productivity in particular has declined since about the 1970s, the early 70s. And I believe that has very little to do uh, with the level of unemployment. It has much more to do with the extent to which government spending was going up, 
government tax rates were going up, and you were taking away the whole incentives for achieving a rapid rate of economic growth. Much of the jobs of the early 20th century, you didn't need an education to get them. Physical brawn would take care of it. Uh, of course. And, and that's why of they Of course, but so excuse me, sir. As the demand for more educated people came along, the more edu those people became educated. They got the skills. They developed the skills. Let me give you a different example, if I may. Because uh, that argument uh, doesn't face to the fact that people are very sensitive to incentives and we'll react to it. Here's Hong Kong, 1945, three or four hundred, five hundred thousand people. An enormous inflow of people from China, again, with empty hands for the most part, though some of them brought capital, some of them were entrepreneurs and businessmen, uh, mostly unskilled, and Hong Kong in its early days produced junk. It's now a high-tech place, no government involvement, very little. Government spending in Hong Kong, never above about 12% of national income, of their national income, went from 400,000 to over 5 million, a tripling of a per capita rate of uh, income, level of income, and essentially no unemployment problem. You have unemployment because the government prevents people from being employed. <coughs> Minimum wage law, the uh, fringe benefits that are required to be done, the, all of the, you know better than I do, all of the burdens that are placed on an employer. Yeah. And so what happens? Employers prefer to hire part-time people. They prefer to work their current people overtime. They try to put off as long as they can, adding more people to their staff. It's a very bad idea. But our people, it's always been a mystery to me. Why people, it should be thought that people are better off unemployed at let's say $3 an hour than employed at two dollars an hour. Why are they better off unemployed at three dollars an hour? Uh, Professor Friedman, let me intercede a, a thought, one, to reinforce that point, the front page story on the German employment problems to, in today's Wall Street Journal focuses again on that point, what they've done to raise labor costs. Jan Meyer from uh, from uh, the, the great state of Kansas, Kansas City Royals country, has a question. Uh, I'm from the Kansas City area. Just before I came over here, Dr. Friedman, one of my legislative assistants, who is very bright, said that he went to the University of Chicago because of the free-to-choose um, programs. And so I think sometimes uh, when you do something like that, you don't realize what a big net you're casting and how wide the influence is. Um, I, I don't expect you to uh, react to this immediately, but I would like your thinking on something um, either, either now or at, at a later time if you're more comfortable with it. Um, I've been very concerned um, with the fact that we don't seem to be able to get a handle on the entitlements in this country. And I always make a sharp difference between the entitlements and the trust fund programs. I'm not talking about Social Security or Medicare. I am talking about the, the programs where we describe the parameters in the law and then if you fit into that parameter, you're, you're entitled to money. And it has seemed to me that taxes will go on uh, and the problems with the budget will go on until we get a handle on uh, the entitlements. And so I have introduced a bill with an, a number of co-sponsors that says uh, that we will freeze AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, at the 92 level and send it back to the state in block grants so that we won't continually enact welfare reform uh, bills at the federal level that don't work. And it, it saves money, but it also keeps us from doing other foolish things. Um, and then the bill says two additional things, uh, that there would not be AFDC unless both parents were 18, and that there would not be AFDC at any age until paternity is established. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I am not an uncompassionate person. In fact, sometimes people have accused me of being too involved with social programs, but I, I think 
that we have gotten so far away from establishing the responsibility uh, of parenthood with the mother and father of the child, and we have almost made uh, the federal government in many cases kind of a surrogate parent. I think we have <coughs> thought about our own teenage pregnancy epidemic. Uh, I think we're responsible for a lot of problems of kids that are born with no man in the house and no real family and they grow up sometimes, not always by any means, but sometimes without sufficient attention and then the things happen that you were mentioning, we have problems uh, <coughs> with education and crime and drugs and gangs and that sort of thing. Um, since AFDC also kind of is the driver behind food stamps and Medicaid and housing and um, a, a lot of other programs, it has seemed to me if we could get people to accept the responsibility um, for, for children and families again, uh, that um, we could get a handle on all of the entitlements. But it really isn't the money I'm as much in, uh, concerned with as the human lives, because I do think that we have raised a generation, maybe a generation and a half, of of young people that sometimes just don't have any roots. No, I agree with you completely on that aspect of it. Indeed, um, one of the things that is fascinating and baffling and disturbing is that we as a collectivity do things in our collective capacity that we would never dream of doing in our individual capacity. In respect of exactly the problem you've raised, I've asked people, I've said, suppose you had a teenage daughter would you tell her, now, if you behave yourself and you don't have any children or anything, you can stay and live at home and we'll, have a, uh, we'll provide for you. But on the other hand, if you go and have a baby, we'll set you up in a separate apartment. You can live by yourself and we'll finance you so that you can finance yourself without having to go to work and have a separate apartment all for yourself. No parent would ever tell a teenage daughter that. I can't believe you would tell your daughter that. I wouldn't tell my daughter if I, my daughter is much older now, but I wouldn't have when she was a teenager. And yet we collectively essentially tell them that. And we provide a tremendous incentive for exactly what you're describing, the teenage pregnancies, the, uh, uh, the uh, AFDC mothers who are 16, 15, 16, one generation after another breeding another. Uh, and I... Uh, uh, I'm not competent to judge your specific uh, solution to it. But the general principle, it seems to me, and one of the, well, let me put it in another way. In 1929, total government spending in the United States was about 11 or 12 percent. And two-thirds of that was state and local. Federal government expenditure was about 3 or 4 percent of national income. Today, total government spending is 43 percent of national income, and two-thirds of that is federal, 30 percent roughly. And I believe one of the great sources of the deterioration in the quality of our social life and the social aspects of our life comes from the shift of, of emphasis and responsibility from the states to the central government. And any program which has the potential of reversing that, and putting the states more in charge and reducing the responsibilities and the undertaken by the federal government seems to me is a very good thing. Whether your particular way of doing that, as you know, there was under the Nixon administration the introduction of block grants, mm -hmm. which turned out not to work as people anticipated. And as we were saying earlier, very few programs do work as anticipated. My own feeling has been about entitlements. Uh, a little different, including AFDC and others. We have too many separate individual programs. You have AFDC, you have food stamps, you have God knows what. You people are much more knowledgeable about this than I, and I'm sure you can list them. Now, what it seems to me you ought to do is to get rid of all of them and replace the whole collection of them by something I argued for many years ago called the negative income tax. And this has two purposes. One is to give people money instead of a whole lot of separate little baffled and get rid of the bureaucracy that is involved in all these programs. Uh, because what happens, 
the pressure for expanding these programs does not come from the people who benefit, if they benefit at all. It comes from the bureaucracy that administers it. You've got a self-generating monstrosity here. And so I would say if you can abandon, if you get rid of all of these other programs, however, the problem with the kind of thing you're advising is that it tends to be put on top of everything else. It's an added program. That's what happened to the block grants in the Nixon administration. And so I think it's very important to design your program in such a way as to minimize that possibility. If I might just, Professor, take a moment, sure. show off a little bit. I can tell, tell the, my colleagues that in the professor's book on price theory, there's an excellent demonstration of the greater efficiency of the negative income tax by use of the Slutsky income variation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that. My staff's going to kill me. But we have Bill Baker from California that has indicated he'd like to. Dr. Friedman, thank you for coming here today. Um, Glad to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a freshman. I've been here about four months, as many of the people at the table, and I was convinced when we came that these bushy-tailed new reformers would be able to turn this thing around in a matter of months. Before we were sworn in, the Democrats were co-opted uh, by their leadership and all the pork that flows around this place, and we haven't heard a word in reform from them since. Uh, the 47 Republican freshmen stayed together uh, for at least three months, but last week all but 12 of us voted for a placebo known as a enhanced rescission, which is worse than what we have now. So I've given up on the Republicans staying together. <laughs> Question, if you were a freshman member, it's similar to being a mosquito in a nudist camp, what target would you attack first? The overspending or attempting to stimulate the private sector and overwhelm government spending by getting rid of, uh, let's say, capital gains tax, increasing depreciation allowance. Noting that we don't have a lot of chance to pass anything, where would you apply your time? Would you work on this reducing of spending or stimulating the real world economy? I, I, I really am not sure I know how to answer that question because I fortunately or unfortunately have not had the experience. But uh, I don't believe you can, I doubt very much that you can separate it out that way. I think you ha either have to work on it, you have to work on a package. You, uh, the most important thing, I think, at the initial stage, is to prevent a rise in taxes of any kind, any shape whatsoever. Because that's going to increase spending. It's not going to reduce the deficit. Stop the bleeding, huh? On the capital gains tax, I believe that the Republicans have been, in my opinion, very foolish in the way they've approached that. Indexing capital, the basic capital gains, would do far more good than a cut in the tax rate. It's more potent in raising the value of property around the country. It's more potent in giving a stimulus to new investment. And I may say, let me go back. There's a good deal of talk around about how the Clinton program is a program of change. That's nonsense. The Bush program was a program of change. I think to talk about the 12 years of Reagan-Bush is utter nonsense. Reaganomics, Lower marginal tax rates, less regulation, uh, restrained government spending. The Bush program, as it worked out, raised marginal tax rates, increased regulation, increased government spending. As I, I wrote in the Newsweek, as in a New York Times op-ed piece, my title was Reverse uh, Reaganomics, uh, and they titled it, uh, uh, well, you remember when uh, uh, Bush was running for vice president. He called it uh, voodoo. voodoo. And so they were, gave it a title, Uduv. <laughs> <laughs> Economics. But that's what, uh, what it was. And so now, so what's the Bush on the economic side? The Bush program was higher tax rates, more regulation, bigger spending. What is the Clinton program? Still higher tax rates, still more regulation, still more spending. So far from being a change, the Clinton program is Bush writ large. It's an expanded version of Bush's program. Well, that's really off the track from your, uh, uh, from your comment. But I do think that the most essential thing is to stop the increase in taxes. 
you. Let me uh, uh, introduce Nick Smith from Michigan, another one of our freshmen. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Friedman, you're one of my heroes. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, uh, uh, whether it's NAFTA or whether it's the problem of getting jobs, we're, we're hearing more and more talk about uh, uh, what I consider isolationism with a suggestion that we can't compete with uh, uh, the dollar an hour wages in other countries. What do you see as the, as the short run and long uh, run solution for this country? First of all, oh, there's no doubt in my mind what the short, what the, both the short run and the long run. What, what some are saying the short run is, is, free trade. is more transfer of wealth, so it seems like we're just as well off. But Free trade. But let me go back. One of the things that baffles me is the extent to which people regard the trade deficit as a, as a bad thing. Let's go back. The Japanese have a very large trade deficit. They have a surplus, in the, from their point of view, a deficit from our, what is it, 50 billion? Right, now, what have they been doing with that 50 billion dollars over the last 10 years? Giving it to us. Inflating the real estate values. They've been making Americans rich. They've been buying golf courses at inflated prices. <coughs> They've been buying uh, property at inflated prices. Almost every one of their investments has gone sour. How have we been hurt by that? We've gotten good goods. We've gotten automobiles. We've gotten uh, recorders. We've gotten all sorts of nice things. And they've gotten bad investments. And insofar as they've had good investments, like the Honda plants or some of those, it's added to our stock of capital. It's provided employment for our people. It's increased our productivity. Have we lost by that, or have they lost by that? Why should we be worried about these deficits? From the point of view of the consumer of the... You see, let me put it to you another way. When I look at legal legislation, it almost always seems to me that legislation is enacted to benefit a small group at the expense of a large group. Free trade is a way of benefiting a large group at the expense of a small group. But Politically, a small group always speaks with a bigger voice. If you were to take a referendum in this country, take a free trade issue, take any free trade issue you want, sugar in the United States now costs what? Two to three times as much as it does in the world because of sugar quotas? Suppose you were to have a, re a national referendum to the Housewives of America. Uh, we have a choice. We can provide you with sugar from American cane and uh, beet sugar uh, at a price which is twice what we can provide you with sugar from El Salvador or elsewhere, Philippines. Which would you rather have? Is there any doubt what the consumers would vote for? Suppose at the time one of my heroes, Mr. Reagan, made the great mistake of going along with voluntary import quotas on Japanese cars. <coughs> Suppose you had had a referendum of all automobile users in the United States which said, are you willing to pay $2,000 extra a car in order to retain a few extra jobs in, in, uh, Detroit, in Michigan uh, in the automobile industry? Do you really think you would have gotten an overwhelming vote in favor of that? We, we aren't doing what the people want. We're, we're doing what certain special interests including as a special interest the government bureaucracies. The reasons the programs you're dealing with expand is because it's in the self-interest of the people who run them to have them expand. But can, can we expect our standard of living to go down? It, I mean, there is... If, which, that, if we have more, more good Japanese goods to have our advantage... No, no, I was thinking as, as we have total free trade, as other countries start learning the techniques of... of of production. As we have more free trade or less. Pardon? More free trade or less. More. I'm saying more free trade. If we have more free trade, we benefit. Look, well, are you worse off to the because extent that Japan is more productive? On the contrary. If Japan is more productive, they have goods and services that you can buy from them at better prices. And they have more money and more resources to buy goods and services from us or to invest in our country. At least they got our dollars they got to do something with. They got to do something. What are they going to do with the dollars? The key, the reason why people are so mixed up, in my opinion, about free trade 
Uh, there are two reasons. One is the propaganda from the producers. But the other is that they don't recognize the role of a floating exchange rate as, a, as something. Suppose for a moment, uh, in the vision that people give, that everything in Japan was cheaper than everything in the United States. Okay? And so we want to buy all of Japan. They're willing to sell us. And they get dollars. But they don't want to buy anything in the United States because we're all too expensive. What are they going to do with those dollars? They're going to try to buy yen. How can they buy yen? Only by offering a better price for yen. But as they offer a better price for yen, the Japanese goods get more expensive and the U.S. goods get less expensive. You can't compare costs between countries. The costs here are in dollars, the costs there are in yen. And which is cheaper depends on what the exchange rate is. And the exchange rate balances in su uh, moves in such a way as to uh, uh, make sure that everybody who wants to get dollars can get them, everybody who wants to get yens can get them. The reason why Japan has had a balance of payment surplus has nothing to do with all the nonsense you hear about dumping and all the rest. It has to do with the fact that they've been saving a larger fraction of their income than we have. And they have to do something with their savings. And the opportunities for investing it at home are limited. And so the investments in the United States are more attractive to them. I assure you that if we were to, if our rate of saving would get to be higher than theirs, We'd have the surplus and they'd have, a, they'd have the deficit. You know, I want to tell you the best argument I've ever heard for free trade. And this comes from Henry George. Henry George was a, was a single taxer who wrote Progress and Poverty, the great book, a, a bestseller of the 1890s. Hi, Dana. And uh, uh, he wrote once, it's a very interesting thing. In time of war, we blockade our enemies in order to prevent them from getting goods from us. In time of peace, we do to ourselves by tariffs what we do to our enemy in time of war. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a marvelous <laughs> way of putting it? Absolutely. It's as good as Basia's petition of the candle. Yeah, right, right. If I, if I might just take a moment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Rob Portman, our newest member from Ohio. Just just elected, here, here. and I want to welcome you to the uh, Economics Task Force, Rob. Thank you. Don't think it's always this exciting, but uh, <laughs> we do want you to come back. Uh, I have uh, three people that have indicated to me they'd like to ask a question. Uh, Lamar Smith, Tom Ewing, and Jay Kim. Lamar Smith is sporting the Adam Smith tie, so we know his, his question yeah, will be nice. Right. Uh, I see there are three, at least three Adam Smith, Smith ties, ties at the table. table. Well, I'm biased. Dick Army gave me this tie, so I'm required to wear it whenever I'm around him. <laughs> uh, Dr. Friedman, I'd like to ask you about three subjects. Uh, the first is the free trade agreement, whether you think that's going to have as positive an impact on the American economy as I think it is. Uh, on the, the American second, economy. Positive, yeah. of an, uh, positive impact on the economy yeah. as I think it is. The second is the energy tax, the BTU tax, whether that's going to have as negative of an impact on the economy as, as I think it is. And then lastly, how much do you think that we can cut government overhead and personnel uh, realistically? Well, answer to the first question is that uh, free trade, I didn't, let me be careful here, free trade would unquestionably have a positive effect on the American economy. If we were unilateral with no agreements, simply to abolish all our duties, quotas and everything, mm -hmm you would have a period of great prosperity. Because you would suddenly be in a position to make the best use of your own resources and to acquire <coughs> most cheaply from anywhere in the world those things that are going. The free so-called free trade treaty, NAFTA, is not a free trade treaty. It's a managed trade treaty. And it has many provisions in it which I do not like. But taken as a whole, mm -hmm. I think it's better than the alternative of what we have now. And taken as a whole, I strongly support it. And I believe it would unquestionably have positive effects for our economy. Uh, on your... Uh, uh, energy tax? On your second question, the energy tax, I am opposed to any taxes. 
<laughs> of any kind. I, I have always said, I have a very simple philosophy on taxes. I'm in favor of cutting taxes at any time, anyhow, anywhere, for any reason. <laughs> because the rule I believe is that government will spend whatever the tax system will raise plus as much more as it thinks it can get away with. Mm -hmm. And I think you will find it hard to find any historical evidence contradicting that proposition. Yeah. So, as a technical economist, you can make a case for an energy tax, at least for some kind of an energy tax, mm -hmm. on the ground of the uh, <coughs> external costs that are imposed on others by energy, and in particular in the case of oil. You can make, there, as a technical economist, I hate to say this, but this is correct, economics, you can make a case for a special tariff on imported oil. Not all imported oil. Mm -hmm. Not for imported oil from Venezuela or from Canada or from Mexico. But because of the costs imposed on the country right. through military activity and otherwise, if a large fraction of our oil comes from, a, uh, from the Persian Gulf. However, I do not favor that in practice. Because you start that road, you'll, you'll never get off mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's like the VAT tax. Technically, the VAT is a very efficient tax. Politically, it's absolutely a disaster. Because it's invisible, it's so productive that it's a standing temptation to the legislators to increase it. Every country in Europe that has introduced it has increased it. Every country in the industrialized nations, as Steve Moore got some figures up for me, mm -hmm that has a VAT tax, has a higher ratio of government spending to income than any country that does not have a VAT tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a VAT tax, I think, would be politically disastrous. But economically, it's a highly efficient technical way of squeezing the uh, suckers down below. <laughs> so I'm not in favor of an energy tax. And the case I make is a very narrow one and would not apply to the broad-based energy tax you're talking about now. Uh, on the third issue, what was your third issue? The uh, third issue was how much do you feel that we can oh, cut yeah. uh, government overhead and personnel. Well, and by the way, I agree with you on the first two issues. That you know, I can't give you a serious answer on that because, in my opinion, the right size for government is about roughly one fifth of where it is now. <laughs> uh -huh. As I believe that, that, that history suggests. The total government spending in the United States, and that also has to do with a number of people hired and overhead, history suggests that the right answer for the appropriate total number, amount of spending is about uh, 10 to 15 percent of national income. I always say 10 percent. The church tithe, when Queen Victoria was at the peak of her power at the time of her jubilee at the end of the 19th century, total government spending in Britain was 10 percent of the national income. In the United States before 1929, government spending, except in time of war, was about 10% of the national income. So 10% seems like about right. And that would mean that you could get rid of four-fifths of it. But as a practical matter, I have never been persuaded that if you simply cut the number of people in every agency of government across the board by 10%, once, and then 10% another time, you wouldn't get greater output. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. By the way, I propose, I want to tell I, you I propose that very same thing, cut 10% at I least I want to give you a, little, a couple of numbers that I, sure. I, I like. I'm going to use it tonight in this talk I'm going to give. Uh, in 19, uh, 1945 or 50, there were 10 million people employed on farms, both owners, family, and employed. And there were 80,000 employees of the Department of Agriculture. Hmm. Today, there are 3 million people employed on farms, and there are 122,000 employees in the Department of Agriculture. If you want to know how to spend money, how to save money, you ought to start by eliminating the Department of Agriculture and all its appropriations. <laughs> I'd like somebody to explain. I'd like somebody to explain to me how it makes sense to spend 54 billion dollars a year on a Department of Agriculture when the total net income from agriculture is $60 billion. 
Thank you. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, uh, let me just say, you uh, now know no. why he's one of my heroes. But <laughs> you know, you also know that I'm an academic. Absolutely, and it's a lot safer for him to talk that way. I've always <laughs> said that the only people who have complete freedom of speech are tenured professors on the verge of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, and I'm long retired, so I have double freedom of speech. <laughs> let me introduce Tom Ewing from your uh, state of Illinois. One of your one of my yes. former state of Illinois, sure. Yes, and, and from the uh, greatest agricultural district. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I would uh, just uh, point out that uh, two thirds of the department's employees deal with food stamps and social programs, and not with agricultural programs. Uh, Ed Madigan would want me to remind you. Uh, the question well, I let have. Let me take you back. Hold on, I want to give you another <laughs> fact. One one good fact deserves another. Okay. In 1950. The item classified as expenditures for stabilizing farm price and incomes amounted to 100, corrected for inflation, adjusted for inflation, amounted to uh, uh, $1,500 per person employed. It now amounts, if I remember, to $4,500. And that's the strictly agricultural part. Doctor, thank you for coming in. But the question I, I really wanted to pose was not in the agricultural yeah. area. Uh, being uh, from a rural area and uh, being a pretty pragmatic uh, business person, I have been uh, very concerned about the escalating deficits and uh, feel that probably that's the most dangerous thing for the Ameri survival of America as we know it today and our economy and wonder what uh, some economists, some at the University of Illinois, which are in my district, say, well, our deficits aren't too large for our uh, gross national product. Uh, I happen to believe they are, and wonder what your thought would be on the well, long-range effect of continued deficits. I do not believe that the real problem, is, uh, I don't agree with you at all. Because the real problem is not the debt, but government spending. It's government spending which creates the debt that's a real problem, not the debt itself. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can put this in a very simple way. There's a certain total amount of resources that the United States has available to it. Call it 100. If government spends 50, only 50 is available for private enterprise to use or private individuals to use for consumption and production and saving, investment. Now, so far, I haven't said a word about how this 50 is financed. Whether this 50 is financed 100% by what we call taxes or 100% by what we call borrowing, it's still true that the amount available to the, re to the private system is only half of, what's of the total. And so it's this part that government spends that uses resources. Now, what about the, uh, what difference does it make which way it is financed? It does make a difference. What we call a deficit is simply a form of taxation. It's hidden taxation. It's taxation uh, in several, one of several forms, it may be, if it's, if it's really financed by printing money, then it's taxation in the form of inflation. If it's not financed by printing money, it's a, invisible tax on all property because you own a piece of property but you have to figure from the future income of that property then more of it will have to be taken from taxes in order to finance this debt that is here so it's a and those are bad taxes they're not wholly bad taxes but they're not good taxes and therefore I would prefer not to finance by deficits on the other hand when people talk about how much damage interest payments are doing to the country, I want you to name me any expenditure of government that does less harm than interest payments. <laughs> interest payments don't use up any resources. There are no labor, no labor that's unavailable for something else. There's simply a transfer from taxpayers to, uh, to bondholders. They do cost, dead weight cost of collecting the taxes and the effect that has on incentives. So there is a net cost. But there's no resource cost. Let me ask you a different question right now. Let's suppose that the U.S. government, miraculously, the debt were to disappear. 
overnight. And interest payments, which are now what? 100 and how much? 200 billion. 200 billion. 214 billion. Or 214 billion disappeared overnight. You think the deficit would be reduced by 214 billion? You're oh, suggesting we would spend it somewhere. Absolutely. Else. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I regard the inter at the moment in a Congress which will spend everything the tax system will raise, I regard the debt and interest payments as performing a positive function. <laughs> Of, of keeping money away from the Congress to waste. <laughs> uh, this is very uh, unique. And, and I, <laughs> now, let me get back to your basic question about debt. Is there any accumulation of debt which would be bad? Of course. Beyond a certain point, a debt accumulation will not be, a government cannot handle a debt accumulation except by monetizing it. And that produces inflation, and that does disastrous harm. So I'm not arguing that a debt is a good thing indefinitely. But at the present moment, in the state of the United States today, the size of the debt is not one. At the, let me point out that at the end of World War II, the federal government debt was 120-some percent of national income. And now the net federal government debt is something like 40, 45 percent of national income. We never, I, we never heard these arguments back then. And we managed to survive them and to get the debt down. How? We repudiated the debt through inflation. And that is the great danger, that you will repudiate the debt through inflation. So I'm not saying the debt is a good thing. But under present circumstances, at the present level of the debt, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a harmful, nothing harmful about it. The argument that we're imposing a, uh, a burden on our future generations is utterly false. Who's going to receive the interest in those future generations? Future generations are going to have to pay taxes to pay the interest on the debt, but future generations are going to receive the interest. So once again, you're back in a case where you're transferring. Now, now they're, they're, that's not entirely true, because insofar as a debt is bought by foreigners, that does impose a real burden on future generations. And the real burden we're imposing on future generations is from spending, not from the debt. And why? Because, go back, if 50% is being spent by government, only 50% is left to be used for capital formation or for consumption. Suppose government were spending 40%. Then you would get larger savings and more capital formation, and that would produce a higher income for our children and grandchildren in the future. So it's spending that has all the bad effects that are attributed to the debt, not the debt per se. Well, I, I agree that spending is much too high and, and to reduce it would be excellent. Would, would you suggest then if we were to reduce spending, should we reduce taxes or should we apply it to the deficit? Well, if you apply it to the deficit, spending will soon increase again. So I think you have to do both. You reduce taxes, and you see reduction of taxes and reduction of spending should go hand in hand. And I think it's desirable that you reduce spending more than you reduce taxes. I'm not questioning that. Moreover, if you reduce tax rates, it's not clear you're going to reduce taxes. In my opinion, for example, if you were to, if you were to uh, in the capital gains tax, if you were to index the base for capital gains, and don't do anything about the rate. You'd increase the revenue you got from tax capital gains, and you'd also increase economic growth, which would bring you more subsidiary revenue. Again, go back to the deficit. Because people talk about the deficit as if it's a hard real number. The total amount of spending by the government is a pretty hard number. But the deficit isn't a real hard number. Let me illustrate again, going back to interest. You pay 200 and some billion dollars in interest. But part of that is just simply a compensation for inflation. It's not a real cost. If prices are going up 5% a year, and I own a government bond, and I get 10% interest, let's say, on it, 5% uh, of that is simply allowing for inflation. And incidentally, one of the other things that ought to be indexed is the interest payments. 
You ought to permit corporations to deduct only interest in excess of the rate of inflation, and you ought to require individuals to include in their income only interest in excess of the rate of inflation. Otherwise, you're taxing real returns and not, not I mean, nominal returns and not real returns. So that that's also, but uh, you can see that really the real deficit from that point of view is smaller than the nominal deficit. There are other things, on the other hand, if you look at it from an accrual point of view, we're accumulating obligations for the future under Social Security and under these uh, various long-run programs uh, so that the true debt, we talk about the debt, people every, the debt is, again, take the debt. People talk about four billion. That's a fake. That's a pure statistical fiction. Because a billion of that roughly is owned by the government. So it's just a bookkeeping matter. Social Security and various trust funds and the Federal Reserve System. But that's three billion. But what about the present value of the obligations we've assumed under Social Security, under Medicare and Medicaid? The true debt is probably about 10 trillion. I don't know the exact number, but it's a very much bigger than that. So I think the thing to do is to emphasize the programs and cutting spending. And in that case, I want to go back to what you said before. I may say I'm a radical, and I am not a supporter of the Social Security program, even though I am a beneficiary of it. <laughs> I am not a supporter of the Medicare program, even though I am a beneficiary of it. And I, I, I believe all of those are bad programs, which should be, but there's no point in talking about it, because at the moment, that's so far out of the range of possibility that it's a waste of breath. Let me, uh, let me observe that if the United States uh, government were to find a bank loaning money to the United States government, the FDIC would shut the bank down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, let that me tell you something else on that. Uh, if the United States government were to find a broker, a broker who was ch churning his customers' money, the way in which the Federal Reserve churns the government's money, they would be subject to suit. <laughs> That's right. Well, at this point, let me uh, call on Jay Kim, who has been very patient. Jay is another one of our distinguished freshmen and a uh, very uh, effective me new member. Well, first time I met you, sir, but I no wonder why a lot of people calling you uh, there hero, and I agree with them. I'm from Southern California. My district is not very far from Los Angeles, which had a riot uh, not too long ago. Yeah. And uh, every indication, every study uh, indicated that the riot and economic depression has a correlation. You mentioned at the opening remarks that um, the problem we have is not an economy, it's the non-economic issue. And even Rand Corporation stated that the reason why riot is because of economic depression. About? Uh, economic depression. If we had a more job opportunity, we wouldn't have any riots. Can you comment on that? Yes, undoubtedly that's partly true, but I'm, I, I don't believe it's really true. I don't really believe that's a fundamental thing. I think so far as the problem of the inner cities is concerned, the war on drugs and the lousy educational system are more responsible for what's going on and the family problem. Those three things, the decline of culture with the uh, uh, teenage mothers and so on, the generation after generation of welfare, the war on drugs, which is uh, uh, producing uh, uh, a large number of innocent victims, the people who are shot uh, in the course of uh, fights among drug lords, the people who are mugged, but in the case especially of the, of the inner cities, the fact that they're very, diff very ungovernability makes them ideal centers for distribution of illegal drugs. So the drug problem is, is, is really playing a very large role in their decline because they have become the centers. They don't consume it. But people from outside, from the suburbs and so on, come in to buy it then. And in my opinion, we ought to do to the war on drugs what we did to the war on alcohol. We ought to legalize drugs and get rid of it. It's a disaster. It's doing an enormous amount of harm. In addition, we ought to introduce choice in education. 
not limited to government schools, but available to, I try to avoid saying public schools, I like to say government schools, because I think Stanford is as much of a public institution as the University of California. At any rate, uh, we ought to have vouchers for educational choice, uh, widespread vouchers. We have an initiative in California, as you know, which will be on the ballot next year. Uh, and uh, we ought to have a reform of the welfare system of the kind that you are speaking about uh, that would uh, remove that. Now, undoubtedly, no, the problem, let me go back. The problems of the inner cities and of the riots and so on have not, have not been closely correlated with the state of the economy. We've had them when the economy was prosperous and we've had them when the economy was in the doldrums. The state of the economy is, in my opinion, an excuse that is offered for these things rather than the fundamental reason for it. There are plenty, look, how can the state of the economy be the problem, <coughs> unemployment be the problem, when the immigrants from ch China, from Korea, manage to find jobs and to get work and to earn income under these circumstances? The people in Koreatown were, were, uh, uh, devastated in the riots that occurred in Los Angeles. Because why? They had taken advantage of the opportunities open and were able to make a living for themselves. But if you establish a system under which it's more profitable not to work than to work, then you won't work. So I don't believe you ought to center on the problem of employment. I think from the point of view of the inner cities, the three things I've mentioned are the absolute keys. I may say, and in, on the drug issue, which I feel very strongly about, I may say I've never personally imbibed any drug whatsoever, so any of these drugs whatsoever, so I'm not speaking from personal experience. <laughs> let me, uh, let me... Uh, but I, I want to say just one thing on that. We have uh, a group of us have gotten together headed by a judge from Southern California, and I've drawn up a resolution calling for the establishment of a commission to study the changes that should be made in the drug laws. I hope when it gets to you, you people will sign it. <laughs> but I don't expect it. Dr. Friedman, we had agreed that we would meet for about an hour. We've had Sorry. a few people come in. Ron Makeley has come in from Rhode Island. And, of course, you know Dana Rohrbacher. I think uh, you've had something to do with trying to keep him on the straight and narrow through his wayward youth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, if the gentleman, or the ladies and gentlemen, would agree, can, may I, since we have less than five minutes, prevail my prerogative as chair and ask the final question? And if I may, uh, with your agreement, I would like to see your reaction to a, a proposal to do something to make our tax system more of a flat tax system. That was very popular in the 80s, and uh, some of us are thinking about revising that concept and trying to put a revitalization to it, and we would welcome your remarks on it. Well, I am very strongly in favor of a flat tax, as you know. I proposed it in 1963 in Capitalism and Freedom, and I've never seen any reason to deviate it from it then. And I think that uh, the ideal flat tax in my system would be a flat tax not on income but on spending, but not by that, not by sales tax, but by the present type of income tax form in which, however, uh, you are allowed as deductions all additions to uh, assets and, as, uh, and you had to add all uh, uh, negative, all li additions to liability. So what you tax is total spending rather than total income. However, uh, I may say such a tax was proposed during World War II in the Treasury by the Treasury Department, but was, uh, that's a long story. It never got anywhere as part of a wartime program. And uh, at the time, the Treasury drew, drew up forms that could be used to enforce it and so on. Um, <clears throat> but less radical would be to have it on income, straight on income. And a flat tax on income with a fairly large deduction exemption. Uh, one of the things that has happened over the last 50 years 
is that the value of the exemption has gone down drastically. It hasn't, it's been raised in dollar terms, but inflation has more than made up for that. And I believe it would be very healthy to have a larger, uh, a larger exemption, and particularly for children, uh, a family uh, allowance. Uh, I, I can't say anything, but more power to you. A flat tax would be a marvelous improvement over our present system with no deductions for anything except the most strictly defined occupational expenditures. That is, if you have to buy a nail to build a house, you can deduct the nail. But I would say no other deductions. Uh, and such a tax would in practice be more equitable than our present system, which is highly graduated on paper, but in, is in fact regressive in practice because high-income people can f figure out ways to get around it, and they don't. And most important, you know, I have my tax returns from 1934 to now, and it's fascinating to look at them. 1934, one piece of paper. 1939, two pieces of paper. And now I have to submit a tax. It's partly because I've gotten more income, but mostly because the tax system has gotten so complicated. However, on the tax system, you're never going to get what you want on that for a very simple reason. How are congressmen going to raise their campaign funds if they don't change the tax from time to time? How are they going to raise their campaign funds if they don't have uh, loopholes they can put in and take out from year to year? Surely, I think we would all agree that one of the things that could be done that would most improve the efficiency of the United States would be to have a flat rule Taxes cannot be changed more than once every five years. So people would know what to depend on. Now it's absurd. You have to figure every year there's a change coming. And so while I wish you well, I think this is a holy grail you're going after and you haven't got much chance of getting it. Well, that's exactly the kind of challenges we, we appreciate and we'd like to take them up. I want to thank you. I on think the other hand, you know, if you get term limits, nice short-term limits, <laughs> Six-year term limits. The problem of raising funds for, for re-election might not be so crucial, and then you might have a real chance of getting a flat tax. Okay. Again, let me thank the always meddlesome <laughs> Professor Friedman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet with you. Doctor.